along your right of flight, along your route of flight. I went to public school in Georgia. I don't have very good understanding of which states are out west. Hey there, welcome back to Aerosafe, your go-to channel for aviation weather. Today is October 20th, Sunday, October 20th, and it's 11.13 Eastern or 15.13 Zulu. It's a beautiful day today across the country, but we are going to look at it from the perspective of general aviation pilots. We'll be using the Aerosafe Weather Brief checklist to walk through all of this, and that's accessible at gilbertaviation.com slash aerosafe. We're gonna start off, as always, with the surface analysis chart. The surface analysis depicts frontal and pressure systems across the country, and we can use this chart to understand and explain why the weather that we see exists. First of all, we have high pressure across so much of the country. The eastern half of the country, beautiful high pressure, until we move westerly to Nebraska, Colorado area, we see a little bit of low pressure with a large trough extending upwards uh, northerly toward Montana and a little bit of a cold frontalysis down into towards Mexico. High pressure in Idaho and Nevada. I went to public school in Georgia. I don't have very good understanding of which states are out west. And there's another low pressure system right over uh, Nevada, Arizona, California confluence with a trough there as well. Now, low pressure areas and troughs can be said to be rising air or potentially unstable air. As a result, we do tend to see a little bit of adverse weather forming, and that is highlighted over here in the Oklahoma area, Oklahoma, Texas panhandle. The low pressure right here is gonna be pretty much the big story for today. So I'm now on the interactive map on 1-800-weatherbrief.com and I've got it just on the METARs, and this is gonna give us the flight category for each station. Flight category of an airport is where we talk about low IFR, IFR, marginal VFR, and VFR. It is not the same as basic VFR weather minimums for different classes of airspace. For an airport to report VFR, there must be a ceiling greater than 3,000 feet and visibility greater than five miles. For an airport to report a flight category of IFR, there must be a ceiling below 1,000 feet or visibility less than three miles. And low IFR can be reported if there's a ceiling less than 500 feet or visibility less than one mile. Marginal VFR falls between the IFR and the VFR categories. Okay, so looking at those flight category depictions here on the interactive map on 1-800-weatherbrief.com, we do see that those pressure and frontal systems correspond to our VFR versus not VFR weather. East Coast is just totally beautiful. Not only is it VFR, but the depictions of a green circle with nothing in the middle means that there's, it's clear. There's not even a cloud in the sky. And I see that at my home in Kentucky right now. Up near the Great Lakes area, we do see a couple of ceilings start to form. Michigan has overcast at 6,000, still easy to operate as VFR in that area. There are a couple of low VFR areas up here in Duluth. We have a special observation for mist, overcast at 200, one statute mile of visibility. So that puts it into the low IFR category, although the TAF does show that it is anticipated to improve. We do have some ceilings in Florida and it looks like Sebring Regional has scattered at 1700 and broken at 2900. So here's a check ride question. What is the ceiling here at Sebring Regional, Florida? A ceiling is defined as the lowest layer of either broken or overcast clouds. So here, the ceiling is the broken layer at 2900. It's important to remember that because when we talk about flight category, that cloud layer is only a ceiling. So an airport could report VFR, but have clouds at 500 feet if they're, if they're a few or scattered layer. So we need to be mindful that VFR does not always mean VFR. And that's where our VFR cloud clearances come into play. If you're at a class golf airport where echo beacons at 700 feet, you still need to maintain three miles of visibility, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and 2,000 horizontally from clouds. So if you're not able to maintain that, say while you're in the traffic pattern, it doesn't matter if a flight category is VFR or low IFR, you would still be breaking the regulations by getting too close to clouds. 
where we begin to see a little bit more adverse weather and what I would refer to as weather where um, an instrument rating and an instrument flight plan would be necessitated, we begin to see that over here in the Texas and New Mexico area. We see some fog in the Colorado area and Denver, so that would be a no-go for most of us. Personally, do not like to take off in a piston engine with less than a thousand foot ceiling. And I want to be able to potentially return to the field in the case of an engine failure or abnormality, or be able to find a good place to land when I'm below a thousand feet. And there is some fog over in California, Oregon, and Washington here on the coast. Ooh, yucky, yucky stuff up here. So from what I'm seeing, vast majority of the country is going to be VFR. We've got this area over New Mexico, Texas, and parts of Colorado that are IFR, or would you'd really want to have an IFR flight plan. Now this, this area here where we have marginal VFR would be potentially a really great spot to work on some instrument currency and proficiency, as long as you are current or you have an instructor with you who is. Alrighty, we will move on from flight category and we'll look over at SIGMETs to begin with. Not a whole lot. We do have some convective outlooks over those areas we were just looking at and some actual SIGMETs here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the radar as well for some precipitation. In Colorado, convective SIGMET Area of thunderstorms moving from the south at 20 knots tops up to flight level 350. And here in New Mexico, area of embedded thunderstorms moving from 240 at 20 knots. So you would definitely want to stay away from the convective segments. And here's another check ride question. How far does the FAA say we should stay away from thunderstorms? The FAA tells us we should stay at least 20 nautical miles away from a thunderstorm. However, thunderstorms can have a different amount of vertical development. The higher a thunderstorm develops, the more energy there is in the atmosphere and the greater the hazards are associated with that thunderstorm. So with a minimum of 20 nautical miles, I would encourage you to stay at least 10 miles away for every 10,000 feet of vertical development. Well, where do we find the vertical development of a thunderstorm? Well, we just saw it by clicking on this convective segment tops to flight level 350. So stay away from the convective segments in the southwest and be mindful, very mindful of the convective outlooks. The outlooks are issued when all of the ingredients are present that are necessary to create a thunderstorm. Thunderstorms require sufficient moisture, lifting action, and an unstable lapse rate. So if we go back to the surface analysis chart, we can see why these thunderstorms are forming here. We have a cold frontolysis, which is a cold front with a, uh, that is weakening in strength. You know what? It's hard to tell from this depiction, honestly, whether it changes into a warm front or this is a stationary front. Either way, we have a mass of cooler air and a mass of warmer air. Now that warmer air is most likely gonna be nice and saturated from the Gulf here. And as that colder air advances, it is forcing the warm air up. Add to that, we have low pressure, which as we talked about already is rising air. As that warm moist air is forced up from the cold front and pulled up by the low pressure system, we now have our lifting action and our unstable lapse rate. So we've got all of the ingredients right here and that is why we see those thunderstorms forming and the convective segments being issued in that area. Next, we'll look at air mitts. As could be predicted, we do have a lot of air mets in that area. We have Mountain Obscuration, which is an air met Sierra. We've got IFR Conditions, which is also an air met Sierra, and an Icing air met, which is the air met Zulu. Icing, of course, is a really big deal for us as general aviation pilots because most of us do not have certification for flight into known icing. We do not have ways to mitigate structural icing. Ice affects our aircraft adversely in all four forces of flight. It increases our weight, decreases our ability to produce lift, increases our drag, and decreases our ability to produce thrust. So icing, really bad, no go. Do not ever fly into icing conditions. I would just stay away from this area and wait to fly another day. Between the convective segments, the IFR conditions, the icing, but also the mountain obscuration, 
This is an area that I would not be flying in today in a piston engine aircraft. We also have air mets along the coast of California, which is pretty common this time of year with um, that marine layer, the fog that comes in. We do have two air met Sierras, which is mountain obscuration and IFR conditions. We have a low level turbulence and a low level wind shear air met. Airspeed loss or gain of 20 knots or more below 2000 feet AGL. Low level wind shear is particularly dangerous because when we're close to the ground, typically our airspeed is lower than in cruise flight. And so a loss of 20 knots when you're already just 15 knots above your stall speed, that could mean that um, you're no longer flying. You're now stalled. Very dangerous, especially when you're close to the ground. And it's particularly difficult to maintain a stabilized approach or departure when there is that low level wind shear. I choose not to fly in low level wind shear and I would encourage you to do the same. We do have an IFR air met up in that Duluth area where we looked. Um, ceiling below 1000, visibility below three miles due to mist and fog. There's also a turbulence air met below 12,000 feet in Montana. There's some wind coming over the mountains there and we're getting some effect of, of that. So from what I'm seeing, East Coast looks beautiful. We've got that area in the Southwest where we've got some convective activity. I would definitely be a little bit more mindful there because there are some hazards in that area. And then along the coast of California, up in uh, Washington, I would not be flying up in there today because of the IFR, the mountain obscuration, low level wind shear. There's a lot of nasty stuff up there. And my guess is that that's because of this low pressure that's coming in and the different fronts that are moving around it. All right, we'll glance briefly at PIREPS. And my guess is that most of the PIREPS are gonna be in those areas that we have already talked about. And indeed they are. So we see some reports of turbulence. I don't see any for icing. Most PIREPS do come from um, airlines. So they, they tend to fly in more adverse conditions. So the importance of them reporting the actual conditions is a lot greater. Um, I do not often see many general aviation aircraft providing PIREPS. And I think that's a big bummer. It makes sense because most of us as general aviation pilots are not flying in super adverse weather. You know, we want ideal conditions like there exists across the East Coast here. Um, so there's not really conditions that we need to report. However, I would encourage you to get into the practice of providing PIREPS so that as you advance into your career and maybe your personal minimums increase, when you are in some more adverse conditions, it's already a part of your process and you are able to provide valuable information for the pilots operating at the altitudes where you are. If you are actually planning a cross-country flight, you would want to ensure that you do look at the PIREPS across your route of flight. Okay, so PIREPS kind of confirm what we already looked at. We would look at cloud coverage next and utilizing the 1-800 Weather Brief website, that would be under weather charts, and it's the cloud coverage chart right here. This is only a forecast and the shortest amount of time we're able to observe out to is three hours. This supports everything we've already looked at. However, we do see low ceilings along the Carolinas. This is really great because my friends over at the Midlife Pilot podcast are doing a live recording of their podcast this week over in West Virginia at this airport for Golf 7, Fairmont, West Virginia. As of right now, it looks like the weather's gonna be perfect for our friends and their viewers to fly in to watch that. Along those lines, let's look at some other forecast charts. Visibility, surface winds, precipitation, and weather. Again, this is only a forecast, so we're only able to go into the future. This chart supports a lot of what we already looked at. So this chart depicts surface winds and um, some air mets, some freezing and IFR air mets, and it also gives us precipitation. We do see indications of convective uh, activity or thunderstorms over the southwest like we talked about. We see IFR conditions along there and also along the coast and some precipitation. Strong winds in the Midwest region, um, I see up to 25 knots, pretty strong, 30 knots up in the Montana area, which is also where we saw that low, uh, that low level turbulence, 12,000 and below. So what's going on here is that winds blowing over the mountains and creating that surface turbulence that gets pretty bad. Freezing level will become increasingly important as we move into the winter months 
and the freezing level comes down in altitude and we get a lot of clouds and precipitation. As general aviation pilots without certification into flight and snow icing in our airplanes, we have to be super mindful of where there is visible moisture and also temperatures are at or near freezing. Those are the two ingredients for icing. Temperatures near freezing and visible moisture. Here today across the US, our freezing levels are all pretty high. Further, we already know that there's not a lot of clouds across all of the US. So it's not really that big of a concern. If you were flying in an area where there were clouds and terrain, that's where you wanna take quite a bit of caution to be mindful of the conditions along your flout, along your right of, along your right of flout, along your route of flight so that you can maintain safe conditions. Winds aloft would be one of the next things we would wanna look at. Of course, that information is necessary for you to calculate your time in route and from that your fuel burn. We already looked at the aviation surface forecast. The indications here supported all of what we saw earlier with the from the surface analysis in the airmets and sigmets. We looked at the METARs and TAFs and the last thing you would want to do is call 1-800 weather brief if you were doing an actual flight and talk to a weather briefer to get a little bit more in-depth information, cover any holes that you might have had in your weather briefing. They might make some suggestions that would be incredibly useful. Remember that you can get this weather brief checklist on gilbertaviation.com slash aerosafe. It walks you through all of the part 91103 pre-flight action requirements and then expands upon the weather reports and forecasts that you would want to look at to feel really confident in knowing that you got all of the information necessary or pertaining to your flight. If you find these videos useful and you're interested in supporting this channel, you can check out the options at patreon.com slash aerosafe. Every view and comment and like is really appreciated and they all go towards the goal of this channel, which is to help you become a more confident and empowered pilot when it comes to weather related decision making. Weather is a contributing or causal factor in far too many general aviation accidents. So the best way to prevent that in your own life is to work on improving your weather knowledge and your decision making ability. If you're interested specifically in improving your weather theory understanding and your decision-making availability, you can check out this video here where I detail three weather resources all to help you become a more confident and empowered pilot. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye.